Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. I recently acquired this very nice looking Lin drum that needs some repair and servicing to make ready for a new owner. It has the usual problems that we encounter in an unserviced Lin drum. The old NICAD batteries have been removed and there's a little damage from battery leakage. The pads are dirty and sometimes double trigger. And the pots and the sliders are, are dirty and scratchy. This one also has a functional issue that the toms and conga sounds are dead. First let's troubleshoot and repair the toms and congas and then I'll show you some of the upgrades I designed to address some of the other items. So let's take a look at the toms and congas. Here's a uh, bass drum sound for reference of the volume level. And here is the low toms, the medium toms, and the high toms. So with the volume on the Lindrum at maximum, I can faintly hear a tom-like sound on the low and the high toms, but I don't hear anything happening when I hit the medium toms button. Switching over to percussion sounds, um, here's the low and high congas. So I can faintly hear something when I hit the low conga button, but nothing when I hit the high conga button. Since the switches haven't been cleaned yet, it's possible that this switch for high conga mid toms is just dirty and not triggering. So let's actually try triggering the sound by bypassing the switch. Looking at the bottom of the circuit board, we can see where the pins of the switches are soldered in. If we take something metallic, like say this alligator cable, and use it to short out the two pins, we're basically doing the same thing as holding that switch down, if, assuming the switch were working. So let's try it first on a working sound. And now let's try it on that medium uh, toms. And I do hear a very faint tom sound. This won't wind up being a coincidence, but the circuitry in the Lin drum for the toms and conga voicing is grouped together handled by a different set of circuitry than all the other drum and percussion sounds. And this is the schematic for it. In a nutshell, a, a four-bit code indicating the desired sound is latched into these two flip-flops at U72 and U73. These flip-flops provide control lines which select which tuning pot is enabled, which output the resulting sound is routed to, and which pair of ROMs uh, the congas or the toms is enabled to make the sound. The tuning pots provide a control voltage for this oscillator chip, U80, which clocks these two cascaded counter chips. These chips count up in binary, providing sequential addresses for the selected EEPROM chip. The highest bit used in the counter, up here, actually selects which of the two chips to enable the output on. For each address of the selected EEPROM, eight data bits present themselves as outputs, which are then fed into this DAC chip. So after this op amp U85, we'll have an audio waveform that we can look at on our scope. This waveform is then filtered by a CEM3320 Curtis filter chip. This 556 timer is, and some additional circuitry here, is used to form a simple envelope which is connected to the control voltage input of the Curtis chip. And then the output of the Curtis chip is connected to the drum outputs through this demultiplexer. Got it? Good. So where should we start looking for our problem? Since I can faintly hear some toms, I'll verify that the DAC is outputting an audio signal. And if so, we can rule out all of this digital stuff and be left with the filter CV generator, the filter itself, and the output demultiplexer. And sure enough, we can see that there's an audio waveform here at U85 when I press a toms pad. Of the three possible culprits we're left with, I'm going to check out this demultiplexer chip first. It's a CD4051 chip, and I've come across a lot of failed 4051s in my time. So let's take a look at the input to this chip on pin 3. So pressing a toms pad, I can see that there's nothing there. So there's no audio coming into the multiplexer. 
and that means the problem is ahead of this point. Now there is a capacitor uh, right here between the filter chip and the demultiplexer that's uh, to remove the DC offset. So for good measure, let's connect to the other side of that capacitor and check, check there. So on this side of the capacitor, uh, the voltage appears to be a constant 14.4 volts. So we verified that there's audio here at the input to the Curtis filter chip and that there's no audio here at the output of the Curtis filter chip. But before we can conclude that the problem is with the filter chip itself, we need to check out the control voltage input to the chip. So I'll hit the Tom's pad a few times and we can see that little envelope there is the control voltage envelope and it appears to be okay. So at this point we are going to go ahead and pull this board and replace the Curtis chip. I added a socket for the replacement chip because the uh, Lindrum traces are very fine and I often see that people have uh, damaged them trying to desolder them. So in case this chip ever fails again, I've just made it a little bit easier for the next person to change it. So uh, I replaced this chip with an Alpha Repar AS3320 chip. These are clone chips produced by a company out of Latvia. I get asked a lot if their chips work as direct replacements in vintage gear, and the answer is yes, they do. Uh, though with chips containing filters like the 3320 and the 3372, if you A-B compare them with the originals, you can hear a difference. But even with original Curtis chips, you could actually hear differences between chips with different date codes. Regardless, I think Alpha has done a great service to the vintage synthesizer community by producing these niche chips that would otherwise need to be cannibalized from gear that could potentially be repaired and put back in service. So with this bad Curtis chip replaced, now we have our, our low toms, our mid toms button doesn't work, so let's uh, pop the lid and, uh, and try it out side like this. So that's mid, mid toms and high toms and then percussion sounds we have a low conga and again, the button is not working for high conga so we'll try it with the, the jumper cable and there we go. Now that the Lindrum is repaired I want to show you some upgrades I've developed that address the top two pain points I encounter when servicing all old Lindrums dirty or broken sliders, and dead and leaking batteries. The Lindrum sliders get gummed up and stop feeling smooth. They get scratchy and have dropouts. Sometimes they get damaged due to abuse, and other times I've seen them break internally, where the wiper just breaks off the shaft and can't be repaired. In a previous Lindrum video, I walked you through the process of cleaning the sliders, which involves desoldering them from the board, disassembling them, cleaning them, re-lubricating them, reassembling them, and then reinstalling them into the Lindrum. It's a huge pain and only works if all the internal parts of the slider are good, and sometimes they're not. For nearly all models of ARP synthesizers, I make and sell assemblies of new, higher quality, modern sliders that fit in the place of the original sliders. So I decided it was finally time to do the same for the Lindrum. So I've made two different sets of replacement sliders for the Lindrum. First up are the non-illuminated sliders. There's one assembly for the volume sliders and another for the panning sliders. Having them on a single assembly ensures they're all perfectly parallel once you get them in, unlike some fiddly adapters I've seen people selling for other synthesizers. Here's the non-illuminated slider set installed in my Lindrum. The slider heights are the same as the original and they fit the original slider caps. From the outside it's hard to tell these aren't original but we saved a ton of time and we have brand new high quality sliders in there now. 
So here's a second Lin drum. It's going to get the second type of replacement sliders that I've made, and that's the LED illuminated sliders. I've been putting these in ARP synthesizers for years, and by request of a valued customer, now I brought it to the Lin drum. Just like the non-illuminated version, this set consists of two assemblies that just drop into the place of the original sliders. This one can be, but doesn't have to be, connected to power. The reason I'm so big on the LED slider replacements isn't because I like colorful lights, but because the smoothness and precision of these sliders is such an upgrade to the originals. And here's the LED slider set installed in my customer's Lin drum. How cool is this? I mentioned the second pain point on servicing Lin drums are the dead and leaking batteries. We're back to my Lin drum now, and this one had suffered a minor battery leak before I purchased it. The previous owner cut the NICAD batteries off, but there's still some battery corrosion on the bottom of the board. In a previous Lin drum repair video, I cleaned the corrosion from the original power supply and added a battery holder. Well, cleaning the corrosion generally involves sanding the corroded traces of the PCB. You can't expect to put some vinegar on the circuit board and get rid of all the corrosion chemically. It just isn't going to happen. So this process of sanding the board makes dust with lead and fiberglass particles, which is no good for your health. In an effort to cut back on breathing in lead and fiberglass so I can be around longer with the Synth Chaser family, I've made a replacement power supply board. Yeah, there are a couple power supply options on the market already, but mine addresses some shortcomings that I perceive with them. First, this is a drop-in replacement, a straight board swap that requires no soldering and no invasive modifications to the Lin drum. It's user installable, so you don't need to pay a tech and be without your Lin drum for a while. It's all through-hole, off-the-shelf parts. Commonly available through-hole parts mean the supply will be serviceable in the future. The batteries are easily replaceable. The supply takes three AA rechargeable batteries that you can just pop in and out of the holder should they ever need to be replaced. Finally, the price is reasonable. A simple, non-over-engineered design means a lower cost and higher reliability without sacrificing performance. What really grinds my gears is the trend of slick synth salespeople charging hundreds of dollars for power supplies built around cheap Meanwell supplies, like they built them from scratch out of solid gold. Give me a break! Another feature of mine is built-in support for the LED illuminated slider upgrade I showed you a moment ago. There's a little power port here for the LEDs that won't put a drain on the rest of the Lindrum's power supply. To install this new power supply, all I need to do is open up the Lin drum as it is now, disconnect this one cable, remove these four nuts that secure the old supply, and swap it out with the new board. I'll pop in three rechargeable batteries and then I'll be all set. After changing the power supply or the batteries, we need to reset the memory because the memory is going to contain garbage that can lead to strange behavior. To do that, all we need to do is hold the erase button and press load. We hear the beep and we're all set. I cleaned the rotary pots while I had the mixer board out, so the only thing left for me to do is to clean the push button switches and then this Lindrum will be ready for a new home and listed for sale on my website. In this video, we repaired the toms and conga sounds, and in doing so, got a peek at how the Lin drum makes drum sounds out of samples stored in ROMs. We also got a look at some upgrades that I've developed to make servicing the Lin drum easier and playing the Lin drum more enjoyable. I'm Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.